Welcome, everybody. Good morning. My name is Gayla King, and I'm the Northern California Program Director with the Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity, and I'm welcoming you all to our vigil for today. Today, the Interfaith Vigil for Remembrance and Solidarity. I first want to begin with a land acknowledgement to honor the Indigenous people who stewarded the land where we currently reside. I reside on unceded Ohlone land, also known as Oakland, California. And I invite you all to enter in the chat your name, your preferred gender pronoun, a faith community or organization you may be with, and the name of the indigenous people whose land you currently reside on. And let us all remember to join the ongoing efforts for reparations for Native Americans of this land. So I'm just really honored to hold this space and to, I really want to thank all the co-sponsors, the Interfaith co-sponsors for today's vigil that you see here on the screen. And a special thank you for the planning team on the right who really helped to create this powerful space that we're going to be together in for the next, um, next hour or so. Um, the theme for today in remembering the signing of the Executive Order 9066 by President Franklin Roosevelt, which led to the incarceration of 120,000 Japanese Americans. We're remembering that unjust part of our history while we stand in solidarity with other struggles for reparations for African Americans and for the movement to stop AAPI hate. I want to welcome one of the members of our planning team, Jeff Matsuoka, who is going to help talk about this theme and the importance of this theme in more detail. Jeff is the chairperson of the San Francisco Bay Area Day of Remembrance Committee. His mother was a Japanese Peruvian who with her family was forcibly repatriated to a detention camp operated by the Department of Justice at Crystal City, Texas during World War II. So I wanna welcome Jeff to share more about the purpose of today's vigil. Thank you, Gayla. Can you hear me? Great, thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jeff Matsuoka, and as Gayla mentioned, I serve as the chairperson of the San Francisco Bay Area Day of Remembrance Organizing Committee, one of the co-sponsors of this vigil. As Gayla mentioned, this morning we were gathered in an interfaith vigil of remembrance and solidarity. We're here to remember the legacy of Executive Order 9066, as well as stand in solidarity with other communities that have been adversely impacted by the same forces of systematic racism that led Fr President Franklin Delano Roosevelt to sign EO 9066 on February 19, 1942. As a result, 120,000 persons of Japanese descent, two thirds of whom were American citizens were without due process forcibly removed from their homes and relocated to concentration camps operated by the United States government. In addition, about 2,200 Latin Americans of Japanese descent, including my family, were expatriated and imprisoned in separate concentration camps operated by the Department of Justice. It was only through concerted effort that a new generation of young Japanese Americans rallied our community to seek and eventually win reparations of $20,000 and a presidential letter of apology from the United States government for the passage of the Civil Liberties Act of 1988. Of course, these actions did not occur in a vacuum, but were rather the culmination of a long history of racial segregation, oppression, and violence against Asian immigrants dating back to the 19th century. This framework of systematic racism facilitated egregious acts like EO 9066 and regrettably still exists today. It is within this framework that we have seen, for instance, the recent rise of acts of both verbal and physical violence against Asian Americans throughout this country. The same forces of systematic racism have harmed and continue to harm other communities of color. February marks Black History Month and we recognize the urgent need for redress and reparations for African-Americans for the grievous harm 
that has been visited upon their community by the very same forces of institutional racism. These harms include slavery, systematic socioeconomic discrimination, and disproportionate rates of incarceration. For the first time since its introduction in 1989, the House Judiciary Committee has passed House Resolution 40 to the full House for a floor vote. This bill would establish a commission to study the effects of, quote, slavery and discriminatory policies on African Americans and recommend appropriate remedies, including reparations, unquote. This bill mirrors the one that Congress passed to establish the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians in 1980, which studied the effects of EO 9066 and whose recommendations resulted in reparations for the 80,000 Japanese American concentration camp survivors. We as Japanese Americans must stand in solidarity with our African American brothers and sisters and urge passage of this landmark legislation, as well as other similar initiatives at the state and local level. Finally, many of the injustices that I have spoken about can be seen as effects of global government and commercial policies. Much of the generational wealth of America is based on the institution of African slavery. The abduction of Japanese Latin Americans was for the purpose of prisoner of war exchanges during World War II. We must be especially mindful and vigilant to ensure that the current geopolitical tensions between the United States and China are not used as a pretext to further harm our Asian American communities. Now, 80 years after the signing of EO 9066, we have come together in this interfaith vigil of remembrance and solidarity to resolve that what happened to our Japanese American community must never happen again to another community in America. In America. That is why it is so important to not only remember the lessons of the past, but also to build upon them and work in solidarity so that we can create a more fair and equitable America. In the words of Dr. Martin Luther King, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, for that powerful framing for our vigil today. For the first theme and our two speakers, we get to hear from Chizu Amori, a 91-year-old activist who spent three and a half years incarcerated at Poston, Arizona during World War II. Chizu spent many years studying that historic period and has been an activist for civil rights since her days as a student at UC Berkeley. Chizu has also been writing for several Asian American newspapers. Chizu will be followed by Tara. Tara is a minister's assistant in the Berkeley Buddhist temple. Tara is the granddaughter of four grandparents who were also incarcerated during World War II in Heart Mountain in Topaz and her grandfather served in the 442nd. Welcome, Chizu. Good morning. Uh, February 19th, the Day of Remembrance is observed every year by Japanese American communities all over the United States. Where it's the day in 1942 that President Franklin Roosevelt signed that executive order which set into motion the incarceration of roughly 120,000 Americans of Japanese descent in 10 major concentration camps and something like 50 or more smaller camps and prisons across the United States. I myself was one of those, a 12 year old girl who along with my parents and two sisters were sent to Poston, a camp in Arizona and we were there for three and a half years. After the executive order was issued, the government went into action, setting up temporary assembly centers all up and down the West Coast and 90% of us were held in these makeshift places like racetracks, fairgrounds and other such facilities. Almost no one escaped the dragnet, including orphans and people in hospitals. After a few months, we were herded into hastily constructed tar paper barracks placed in barren, desolate places in the country and left with no idea of how long we were going to be imprisoned. It was a tremendous shock to our community. We had already suffered the loss of thousands of menfolk 
community leaders and those considered dangerous who had been picked up by the FBI on or soon after December 7th, 1941, leaving immigrant women and children to cope with the situation. Some families lost contact for a while with those husbands and fathers who were rounded up, but who had ended up in Department of Justice camps. And there are instances, instances of men vanishing altogether. This had happened to us because we were labeled by the government as potential spies and saboteurs. The obvious reason was a racist reaction to a war with Japan. Our entire group was branded as foreigners, enemies, and not American. At the time, as an unsophisticated country farm raised girl, I was in no position to understand what had happened to us. Yes, we were Japanese, but what had we done? Why were we here? It was only as an adult many years later that the full picture became clearer. There had to be scapegoats for the surprise attack on our country. One generation, the parental generation, the immigrants who could not become American citizens lost almost everything. On top of that, the government developed a policy that divided us into loyal, disloyal categories, segregating the so-called disloyals into Tulilate, the most prison-like of all the camps. A system of informers and FBI agents operated within the camps, spying on all of us during the incarceration. My own family was impacted by all that went on for my father no longer wanted to stay in this country and applied for repatriation to Japan. I disagreed with that choice. So we had a big struggle over that. In this way, children and parents were pitted against each other in this terrible policy of separation. Then the government decided to draft the boys into the army. Another divisive struggle took place within the incarcerated community. At the end, my family did not go to Japan. We were given $25 and a train ticket to wherever we decided to go, leaving everyone to fend for themselves with little help from the government. For instance, one old man who had dementia and refusing to leave was forcibly put on a train and expelled at the train station in Seattle. Another family was put on a bus and dumped out on the streets of San Francisco. I was very active in the redress and reparations movement and became a named plaintiff in the class action suit started by William Horry in Chicago. The case made its way up to the Supreme Court where we had a hearing in 1985. Our community had a big success in 1988 when a redress bill was passed and signed by President Ronald Reagan, granting us a token amount of redress and an apology from the president. This was something of a miracle and quite a precedent. So I am very interested in a similar campaign for reparations for African-Americans. And then we might think of others who have been gravely impacted by racism in the United States, like Native Americans. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chizu, for sharing your story with us and also for all you have done uh, to fight for justice. Uh, I am Tara, I use she, her pronouns, and I am Yonsei, which means I'm fourth generation Japanese American. And as Kayla said, I am the granddaughter of Teruko, Kazuo, Miyako, and Ryo, all who are Nisei, our second generation, um, and all who were incarcerated during World War II in Topaz and Heart Mountain my grandfather fighting in the 42nd. So three of my grandparents passed away either when, or before I was born or when I was really young. So I wasn't able to hear their stories um, from them. Uh, my grandpa Rio, he wrote journals as he began to battle Alzheimer's. And I was able to read these and in those many pages, uh, there was only one sentence uh, about being incarcerated. My grandma on my dad's side, lived until the age of 94, um, but she only told us about the camps if we asked. I mentioned the, the journal and how my grandma didn't talk about the camps because when I think about my grandparents and who they were and who they are to me, 
while incarceration is something I do often share with others and something that greatly impacted them and future generations, it isn't who they are. While this experience impacted their lives significantly and how they interact with the world around them and the intergenerational trauma being passed down through the generations to me and my sister um, and resulting in things like anxiety for me, it also didn't define who they were. I remember getting sherbet ice cream with my grandpa and how my grandma would always make sure the dogs weren't in the house because we were scared of them. And I remember, um, well, I was told stories of how my grandpa um, on my dad's side would go to the basketball games and cheer for the other team because they were losing. And of course, I remember my grandma, um, Paduka or Terry, because we grew up with her. As kids, she would make us snacks and spam musubi or anigiri or rice balls. Um, and I remember also how scary it was to almost lose her at age 90. And then how wonderful it was to be able to spend an, another four years with her. So I share these stories because that's what I remember. And also just as a reminder that as we talk about injustice, we also remember that it is people who have faced the injustices. Today's event is to remember the past injustices and that they happen to people and to bring light to present injustices that are happening to people and how it is important to do what we can to support each other to prevent these injustices from happening again to people. Earlier, I had mentioned intergener intergenerational trauma and without getting into it, we experience trauma and have a reaction to the trauma because we are human. And so what I've learned is while these traumas and struggles leave us to survive and figure out how to heal from them, we're not alone in healing. And we don't heal alone. We all have each other, and I'm not just talking about within one religion or within one ethnic group, but all of us. Just being part of this planning committee and learning from and working with all of these wonderful people reminds me that we are all here to support each other. So I'm Jodo Shinshu Buddhist, and one of the main teachings in Buddhism is interconnection. Part of that is I'm here today because my grandparents and parents and because of their struggles and triumphs and because of who they were and who they are. And it is my grandparents' struggle that led me on the path to be a social worker and to be involved in social justice work and why I'm speaking with all of you today. And it's also about making sure what happened to them doesn't happen again. And to make sure as others supported them and as they supported me, that I can then pass on and pass forward that support to others because we're all connected. Another piece of interconnection is that we can't do things alone. We need support from others throughout our lives. And while we live in an American society that has the problematic mentality of individualism, it is so important to realize that we need to support each other through the good and the bad and the in-between. And right now, as we have this vigil. The African-American community is standing in solidarity with the Japanese-American community for today's remembrance of injustices. And the Japanese-American community, we are standing in solidarity with the African-American community to fight for reparations and to bring some healing to all of the many injustices that the African-American community has faced. My grandparents taught me about injustice and have taught me about community, and now, Communities no longer need to stand together alone to survive. We need to now stand together across communities to get through the struggles and difficult times and to heal. So thank you again so much for having me here today and for all of you being here. And to, I wanted to also thank all the wonderful organizers, performers, and speakers today. Wonderful. Thank you, Tara. Thank you, Chizu, for your bravery and sharing your testimony and stories with all of us. We will now be hearing from Reverend Harry Bridge, the resident minister of the Buddhist Church of Oakland. Reverend Bridge spent his youth in both the United States and Japan studying Buddhism. Reverend Harry. Thank you. Uh, it's an honor to be participating in this vigil with you from the Buddhist Church of Oakland. 
Uh, for my musical offering, I will be doing uh, two short chants from the Jodo Shinshu Buddhist tradition. And uh, I'd like to briefly introduce the temple, uh, but maybe more importantly, and specifically the bell that I'll be ringing. Uh, Buddhist Church of Oakland was founded in 1901, uh, but the present building was built in 1927. So, you know, during the internment, uh, it was boarded up, but protected. And one of the items that survived was the daikin, uh, the bell that I'll be ringing, and it's dated to 1940. So the temple received the bell um, only about a year or two before uh, the interment happened. So, you know, this bell survived the interment and has been rung during services ever since. And it's just a really powerful experience for me to, to ring it. So the sound of this bell will be featured during the chanting. I'll recite Sambujo, uh, the three respectful callings, as well as the traditional echo or verse of merit transference. Uh, so I'll say it in English first and then chant in the traditional Japanese pronunciation of the Chinese text. Namanda, namanda, namanda. We respectfully call upon Amida Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha, and the Buddhas of the Ten Directions to enter this hall as we joyfully scatter flowers. merit be shared equally with all beings so that we may all awaken the aspiration for enlightenment and be born in the land of peace and bliss. Reverend Harry. We will now transition into our theme of solidarity for reparations for African Americans. 
We are honored to be joined by two African-American pastors based here in Oakland. First, we will hear a faith reflection from Reverend Marjorie Wilkes Matthews, who serves as a pastor at Plymouth Church. Marjorie is a fifth generation educator descended from several generations of women who have dedicated their lives to teaching and improving educational opportunities for disadvantaged children. Reverend Wilkes Matthews will be followed by Reverend Dr. Theon Johnson III, a fellow advocate for justice Reverend Dr. Theon Johnson III serves among the people of Downs Memorial, a historically black United Methodist Church committed to putting faith in action. Welcome, Reverend Marjorie. Thank you, Gayla. It is such a blessing to be with all of you today. It is such a blessing to stand in this circle of solidarity a blessing to share with all of you in this time of remembrance. Thank you to everyone who's been part of planning this gathering today. And thank you to all those who have spoken so truthfully and inspiringly up to this point in our gathering. I wanna begin you all by confessing that I struggled. I really struggled with where to begin my remarks this morning and so, I finally decided that the best place to begin is by professing a fundamental truth, which is simply this, I hate racism. I hate racism. I hate racism in all its various forms. I hate the racism that underlies the shootings of unarmed black people. I hate the racism that underlies the assaults and attacks on AAPI people. I hate the racism that incarcerates immigrants and refugees from Guatemala and Honduras and El Salvador and Haiti and so many other places. People who are simply seeking safety and economic opportunity in this country. I hate racism and all its ravages. Raise your hand if you hate racism, if you're sick and tired of racism. <laughs> If we wanted to phrase it more positively, rather than saying we hate racism, we would say instead that we love justice. Raise your hand if you love justice. Raise your hand if you love justice. We are living in a time when the call for racial justice has grown louder and more urgent, a time when the call for reparations, the call to heal and repair, because that's a root word of reparations, right, to repair the call for healing and repairing the harms of this country's historic and ongoing racism has grown louder and more urgent. But we know that the work of repairing any harm, the work of righting any wrong begins with remembering, remembering the harm done and the wrongs committed. The work of repairing any harm of righting any wrong begins with truth telling. Jesus said in the Gospel of John, and I quote, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. But we live in a country that does not love truth. We live in a country that loves instead lies and false narratives. A country where school boards are now banning books that speak the truth, the painful truth of this country's racism. A country where folks who don't even know what critical race theory is, are using that term to condemn any effort to teach the truth, the painful truth of this country's historic and ongoing racism. But Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. A year ago in January of 2021, the church that I serve, the beloved community of Plymouth Church, began reading together Nicole Hannah Jones's essay, What is Owed? The Case for Reparations. And after we read it together, folks were all fired up with a thousand suggestions for how we could help advance the work of reparations and racial justice. And then somebody, some wise soul, it wasn't me, you all, somebody raised their hand and said, but if the work of reparations begins in the work of remembrance, begins in the work of truth telling, then we first have to look at the history of our church. What has our church done to advance the work of racial justice? And what has our church done to impede the work of racial justice? What are the racist sins that we must first confess as a church? 
So we did a little digging, did a little research, read a history of the church, talked to some elders in the church, and we learned some things. Now, before I tell you what we learned, I need to first provide some context by saying that our church, Plymouth Church, has been around for more than 100 years. It was a merger of two congregations, one that was founded in 1874 and one that was founded in 1894, and they merged. They became one church in 1904, so we've been around as Plymouth Church for nearly 120 years. For most of those years, Plymouth Church was a predominantly white congregation. I am, in fact, the first African-American pastor of the church, the first in nearly 120 years. There is a written history that documents the church's first 50 years. It's called the Plymouth Adventure, and it begins with a wonderful story, a story appropriate to this day of remembrance, a story that goes back to World War II about how Plymouth Church worked on behalf of Japanese Americans interned, unjustly incarcerated during World War II. We are rightfully thankful for and proud of that part of our church's history. What's not in this little booklet, however, what's not in this written history is a story that our church's oldest members shared some years ago, and this is the story. Before our church moved to its current location, Plymouth Church occupied a large building on Howe Street in Oakland, where there now stands a parking garage for Kaiser Hospital. During the mid-1950s, the church decided to sell that building on Howe Street, and Plymouth was approached by a predominantly African-American Baptist congregation which wanted to buy the building. But Plymouth declined. Plymouth refused to sell its property to an African-American congregation. There were concerns voiced about how such a decision would change the character of the neighborhood. And so instead, Plymouth sold the property on Howe Street to Kaiser Hospital, which tore down the old church building and erected a parking lot. With the proceeds from the sale of that building, Plymouth Church moved to its current location, a property that straddles the border between the city of Oakland and the city of Piedmont. I mean, literally straddles the border. Half of our church's parking lot is in Piedmont and the other half is in Oakland. We believe that our church and we believe that our country must speak the full truth of our history, not the selective truth, not the half truth. We must speak, we must confess the truth that makes us proud and the truth that makes us cringe. And then we have to decide what to do with the truth, how to celebrate the justice done, how to confess and heal and repair the injustice we've done. We as a church are now praying over what we do with the truth that has been revealed. We are talking, for example, and praying about what we, how we leverage the property that our church owns. And we are talking about how the cost of housing, the explosion in the cost of housing in the Bay Area has affected so many people of color. And so one of, the, one of the conversations we're having is about whether we might take down our church building and build, build instead something that is mixed use with worship space on one floor and with affordable housing on the other floors. As we go forward in this process of prayer and discernment, we are so blessed and so thankful to be part of circles like today's circle to stand with all of you, truth tellers and justice makers. It is a blessing to be with you today for this vigil. May God bless and keep and guide us all as we go forward in the work of justice, in the work of solidarity, in the work of remembrance and truth telling. Amen. Thank you so very much for that witness, Reverend Marjorie. And to each of you who are present, I invite you to join me now in just taking a deep breath. Let's pause, let's everybody, let's take a deep breath in together. Let it go. 
Let's take another deep breath in, breathe in deeply and let it go. Finally, let's take one more collective breath. Take a deep breath in and hold it, hold it, hold it now, let it go. In the many names known of the one who both loves and liberates us all to life, I greet you and wish you peace. We have received a timely and relevant witness, weaving threads of some of the ties that bind us in our collective struggle for justice to be repairers of many breaches. As we prepare our hearts and minds to assume a prayerful posture, I want to begin by calling two names. I call the names of Dr. Walter Morris, one who in one hand held on to Kujo Lewis, chosen family who was the last adult survivor known of the Atlantic slave trade arriving on the Clotilda in the 1860s, who also happened to be a member of the current congregation that I served, now counted among the ancestors. I also call the name of Janice Mirakatani, Japanese American sansei poet, a friend and family member, a co-conspirator whose activism helped shape the social justice culture of San Francisco, herself and family, survivors of forced relocation to internment camps in both California and Arkansas. As we prepare to assume a prayerful posture with words, I invite each of you to be present in the fullness of your body, mind, and spirit. For we approach the moment, this moment, from many traditions sojourns with spirituality and connection to our common humanity. And so in the spirit of the collective breaths that we have shared, I invite each of you to both listen with intention while also adding your hopes, your petitions, and postures that will ultimately push us all more closely towards the creation of a more just, loving, and hopeful reality, the beloved community. It's been said by some that if you sing, you pray twice. And so in honor of that very wise witness, I invoke words penned by James Weldon Johnson as we begin this time of prayer. Let us pray. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who hast brought us thus far on the way, Thou who hast by thy might led us into the light. Keep us forever in the path, we pray. Amidst the song that has been raised in times like these, we pray deeply. Grateful for the gift of uniting in common cause to be in prayerful solidarity with siblings who know the sting of injustice, we acknowledge that pride, racism, sexism, heterosexism, ableism, militarism, and so many other isms have created chasms which have caused some to deny the divine spark in others. We lament the exploitation of all ancestors and pray for their spirits which rest from their labors. We especially name our African ancestors and Japanese ancestors, those who both find themselves rooted in America and then diaspora. We are mindful of generational grief that has been buttressed by state-sanctioned violence against bodies, economic inequality, health disparities, internalized oppression, and model minority mythologies, which for too long have been leveraged as instruments of division in times when the entirety of creation groans for redemption, for a renewed vision. We receive the witness that has been shared calling on those who have been beneficiaries of brutality to work towards a more just and equitable world, redistributing the yield of hands that labored without reward. Stir up within us, we pray, a desire to serve the common good. Steady our vision that we might see the divine spark which resides in all. We pray that our bodies are strengthened that we might be renewed and ready to employ them in service of justice. 
as we reaffirm our commitment to be in solidarity with those who have been unjustly targeted, with those who have been finding themselves a center on the margins of our world. We pray for courage in the face of seemingly great odds. We pray for justice that rolls down like waters. We pray for an ever flowing stream of righteousness to saturate the drought stricken spaces of our society. We pray for strength on this day and hope for a shared future. Help us to pray not only with our lips, but with our lives. May it be so on this day and all the days of our lives. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Dr. Theon, as well as Pastor Marjorie for your words. We will now transition into our second offering of solidarity. Our historical roots of white supremacy that led to the incarceration of Japanese Americans is a part of a long legacy of anti-Asian racism that is manifested in the interpersonal harm experienced by our elders and the systemic violence experienced through incarceration, ICE detention and deportation, as well as the ongoing surveillance and prosecution of Asian American academics and scientists. Today, we, were, we will hear from three speakers to share their own reflections on these experiences with anti-AAPI hate. The first speaker, Dr. Russell Zhang, is a professor of Asian American Studies at San Francisco State University and the co-founder of the Stop AAPI Hate Movement. Dr. Zhang has authored several books and articles on race and religion and will offer a reflection from his Christian Taoist faith perspective. He will be followed by Chanton Bun, a 1.5 generation refugee from Cambodia. After serving 23 years in incarceration, Chanton won his freedom while he continues to be still at risk for ICE deportation. He is currently the Yuri Kochiyama Fellow at the Asian Law Caucus and a father of three. And last, we will hear from Joyce Yee, an activist and photographer based in Oakland. In 2015, Joyce's father was unjustly prosecuted by the federal government after they falsely accused him of spying for China. And her family is currently seeking justice after the government's abuses. So first we will hear from Russell in this recording. Hi, I'm Professor Russell Jen. Uh, from San Francisco State Asian American Studies and co-founder of Stop AAPI Hate. Um, I'm honored to join today at the 2022 Interfaith Vigil of Remembrance and Solidarity. And you know, it's because we've remembered um, of what happened to Japanese Americans during World War II, what happened to South Asians, Arab Americans and Muslims after 9-11 when they faced Islamophobia. It's because we were remembered that we actually created Stop AAPI Hate. We knew Asian Americans would face another surge of racism, be scapegoated for the disease of COVID-19 and face racist violence and policies. And so we tried to be ready. We tried to hold government accountable. We tried to amplify the voices of Asian Americans. So what I've been learning over the last two years as we've um, collected incidents of hate is um, to address the racial trauma we're experiencing. It is a period of collective racial trauma similar to Japanese incarceration. So I'd like to share with you my remarks today entitled Be Like Water, a faith response to racial trauma. As I said, we collected firsthand accounts of racism and we received over 10,000 in the nation. And here are just a couple from of the um, incidents from Oakland. One person wrote in, I'm a firefighter and I was assisting training future firefighters. One day we had a captain from another department assisting us. That day he kept calling me coronavirus instead of my name in front of everyone. Also, no one else was allowed to touch what I had touched that day, like our training iPads. A student wrote in, while I was at school, people would bully me for being Asian. 
They would joke that I'm Asian so that I had the coronavirus and constantly ask if I knew someone with the virus. People have also joked about me eating dogs and have told me to go back to my country. And finally, this parent wrote in, I was walking with my child. While we were talking in our language, a stranger started shouting, go to your F in China, you are people who spread coronavirus. My child was afraid and hid behind me. Again, these are just a fraction of the incidents we've received. We know that one out of five Asian Americans during the pandemic have experienced direct racism like these cases. I highlight these incidents because they illustrate some of the trends we see. First, people are scapegoating Asians for the coronavirus. <clears throat> They're um, with the term Chinese virus, people are saying that the virus is racial. It's a not a biological virus, but it's a Chinese virus. And that term also stigmatizes the people. Chinese and those who look Chinese are stigmatized as being the disease carriers like this firefighter experienced. Not only are we blamed for the coronavirus, but we're facing racist and xenophobic comments. In half of our cases, people tell us things like, um, go back to China, you effing chink, or go back to your country. Clearly, Asians are being perceived and treated as perpetual foreigners, outsiders, the yellow peril who need to be excluded because they threaten America. And finally, because of the scapegoating, because of the stereotyping, because of this racial profiling, we are experiencing racial trauma. Um, sadly, this child illustrates that trauma. People are experiencing high rates of anxiety and depression, fear, hypervigilance, and avoidance of places, just like this child exhibited. So it's a sad period for Asian Americans, and um, history has repeated itself. But as we remember this day, um, Japanese American incarceration, <clears throat> I want to draw on their power, their resilience, their efforts for social change to show how we should be like water at this moment. Asian traditions often write about water and so do biblical scriptures. The Tao says that water is the exemplar of the Tao. We should be calm and clear like water. And similarly, scriptures say that we should be still, mindful, remembering how God is present. And I think that's what we need, especially as faith communities during this moment of racial trauma. Asian Americans are among the most distressed racial groups during this time. And those of us who experience racism have higher rates of stress, anxiety, and somatic symptoms. Those of us who've experienced racism are again showing signs of racial trauma. And they say, when asked what's their greatest stressor during the pandemic, they overwhelmingly say racism is our greatest concern. Think about that. Other Americans hate is a greater fear for Asian Americans than the pandemic that's killed 900,000 people. We're more fearful of other Americans and their hate than we are of a deadly disease. That's because we can mask ourselves against COVID-19, but we can't vaccinate ourselves against other Americans. And because of this fear, because of this anxiety, I'm calling on us to be like water, to be mindful, to be thoughtful, to be remembering God in the midst of our um, trauma. For me, as I become more mindful, as I become more clear about what's triggering me, I've learned how to respond better, to not act out of emotional angry outburst, but instead um, <clears throat> to calm myself, to recognize the spirit's presence within me and how um, Jesus himself has exhibited a clarity of presence, especially in the face of difficulty and hardship. That leads to the second quality of water. Water is humble. Water is fluid, soft, and yielding. And in the same way, Jesus taught us in the Beatitudes to be meek. Water doesn't seek its way. It doesn't force its way, but rather it goes with the flow. It finds a path of least resistance. And for us as Asian Americans during this period of trauma, this 
nature of yielding, this nature of humility, this virtue of um, seeking to forgive is a great way to approach the racism. We know that the intergenerational trauma that we're experiencing by Japanese Americans after incarceration is not to be blamed on individuals. We can't vilify other perpetrators the way we've been othered. Instead, <clears throat> clarity and humility recognizes that the racism perpetuated against us is institutionalized, it's structural racism, it's white supremacy that's our enemy, not individual perpetrators. We shouldn't try to enforce hate crimes that would lead to more mass incarceration, but rather seek um, to yield and to find other ways to change the system that socializes people to become racist. We know last year that policies reinforced and justified the hate. Um, Trump's COVID ban, um, visa bans that banned migration, his cuts in refugee resettlement, his cuts in H-1B visas, his banning of Chinese scientists and researchers, all these anti-China policies, again, vilify an entire people. And these are the policies that we need to work against, not spending our energies in anger and hate towards others. Instead, what I've been learning from our elders is that we need to have compassion. We need to have empathy for perpetrators, understanding it's the system that socializes them and trains them to become racist. If it's a system that is our um, enemy, then we need to be like water that's persistent. Water over time wears away rock. And if we are persistent and faithful in doing good, in due season, God says we will reap. Water has the power drip by drip to erode a rock. And oceans can create waves of change as we come together. That's why during this period, we need to be like water. And I've seen the Asian American come together to make change. I've seen us come together in rallies to do grassroots organizing and chaperoning our elders. I've seen faith communities standing up and working with their denominations and with their um, other um, temples to um, provide solace as we hold vigils together. And it's that type of persistence, that type of support, that type of um, constant fighting for change, that's what won redress and reparation, that's what will get African-Americans reparations, and that's what will lead to social change today. We can't give up, but we need to be like water. And finally, if we're like water, will become restorative to our nation, will become restorative to our communities. Water nurtures everything. And just um, in some of our vein, Jesus called us to be peacemakers, to restore a nation that's torn asunder, polarized by religion, by race, and by politics. As Asian Americans fight for change, as we remember, as we build solidarity with other community colors, we have been able to make change and we have been able to build um, community within our torn apart nation. I'm heartened to say that in just two years, because the Asian American has remembered, has built solidarity and has been persistent in making change, we actually have changed institutions that have harmed us. In California, we passed the API equity budget bill um, to fight Asian American hate. And in New Jersey, um, Asian Americans have fought and won ethnic studies in the classroom. These policies not only benefit Asian Americans, but they benefit all people of color in the fight for racial justice. So I urge all faith communities, let's be like water during this moment of crisis, this moment of trauma. Let's be clear, let's be persistent. Let's be humble. And in so doing, we can be the ones who restore our community. Thanks. Hi, I'm Professor Russell Jen. My name is Chanton Bun. Today we are remembering Japanese American that were forcibly incarcerated in 1942. 
I was never taught about this history. I learned this history while reading a book called Silent Honor by Daniel Steele. When I read about it, I was in shock that this country could do something like this to their own citizen. Just because we look different, we're from different places, and because they fear, they, they force a lot of people to sell their possessions, separate them from their family, and put them in concentration camps. I reflect on it on myself because I'm, I was born during the Cambodian genocide and I lived my younger years in the camps in Thailand, the refugee camps in Thailand. And I know what it's like to not know your parents. I know what it's like to live on mud floors. I know what it's like to look for fresh water. And I know what it's like to live your whole community behind barbed wires with a gun tower, with a, with a gun post in the front stopping you from going anywhere. I was also incarcerated for 23 years. And incarceration is one of the cruelest things that we could do to each other. Today, our community still face this discrimination because we look different. Today, ICE are still deporting, separating our families, our community members from, from their loved ones that, and also take them to, from their home, a place that, uh, the place, sometime a place they only knew. Today I reflect on it and I wanna honor the people that came before us, all our elders that were in the concentration camp, all our elders that went through war, they are heroes because they shared their story with us. They had the strength to tell us what happened. Without them, we would never know what happened. And I also would like to honor the children that lived through it and grew up and fought against it and speak about it and tell their story, their father's story, their mother's story, their family's story, so we know. And today, we can, we can speak up and speak out for every one of them. Some years ago, that was the people out. Just take a chance, baby. You can out some oil jam. ជំនួនជប៉ុនដែលនៅសុខនេះដែលគេចាប់តាចូលត្រង់ឆ្នាំ <coughs> ยิงตรอดจําឲ្យโกนยิงดังឲ្យขโมยจาวไอ้ตังอ๊อกําไมมีเรื่องนี้กะลานน้องเตี้ยสมเนี่ยตังอ๊อกนี่มือพลอยพ
um, and particularly to advance um, the call for reparations and justice for our communities. Um, and uh, particularly on um, the day of remembrance and remembering uh, what happened um, after executive order 9066 and um, with our Japanese American community. Um, because it's very, um, it's it feels very relevant to what has happened to my family and just to be able to hear the stories, um, you know, even to be able to hear the stories many times over, it still um, touches me very deeply. So um, thank you for, thank you everybody for sharing. Um, <clears throat> so this is me and my dad when I was younger um, and um, in 2015, um, my dad um, was targeted by the US government. I was a college student and I was home uh, for the break. And one morning, really early in the morning, like 6 a.m., um, we hear all these knocks on the door. And um, I wake up to people basically telling me to come out of my room with my hands raised. I come out, I see these people pointing guns at me. and see my dad getting arrested. I'm like, what the heck is going on? Um, and basically the FBI came, like swarmed our house, took my dad away and we had no clue what, what they were doing. So after taking my dad to, you know, the federal building and interrogating him and interrogating my mom and just kind of like, you know, doing all this to us, we find out later that day um, after going to court that um, they were charging my dad of passing secrets to China and that were, they were basically accusing him of being a spy. Um, and they were threatening him with 80 years in prison, million dollars in fines. And next thing you know, um, you know, when we came home that day from court, we see all these FBI agents searching, waiting to search our home. And then um, we see the news on um, on TV that uh, my dad is being accused of being an international spy of spying for China. Um, this is like a complete and total shock to us because um, we had no clue this was coming. We never ever would have expected it. And it was completely not true. Um, my dad is a scientist and he um, is a professor so he does research and when you do scientific research you're communicating with different people and collaborating on research projects together and basically what they had done was they had been surveilling um my dad and watching him and reading his emails listening to his phone calls and they had taken some of these emails that he was writing with you know his academic collaborators and basically criminalized it so this is kind of the start of this uh, big ordeal for us, um, where basically my dad was falsely accused of being a spy for China. It was all over the news and we had to figure out how to fight his case. Um, it was really scary, we, you know, he had been surveilled by the FBI, you know, friends stopped talking to us. You know, we were just living in fear all the time, trying to figure out how to, you know, how to prevent my dad from being in prison for the rest of his life. Um, so fortunately, after several months later, um, we were able to figure out how to get some lawyers, which we had no clue how to do at first, and they were able to show that their, uh, the government's claims were completely and totally false, and they dropped the charges. Um, but not after, like, you know, basically trying to ruin our lives. Um, so, you know, after that happened, um, well, while that had happened, we realized that the US government had been targeting other people like my father as well. And they had um, unjustly accused other people as well and dropped cases against them. And this all came against the backdrop of, you know, rising US China tensions. And, you know, every day on the news now we can hear some kind of news about how, you know, the US and China are like feuding with each other and um, China's you know, as of a couple of weeks ago, the FBI director came on and said, you know, China is the biggest national security threat to our country. Um, and every day we hear about this. And so this was the backdrop to all of this. Um, so this was in 2015. 
And, you know, my family has been dealing with the consequences of this, um, just a trauma and trying to get justice because we have no clue why this happened to us. Um, and we've seen even in the past few years, like more and more stories of people, um, the government saying every day that they're opening new cases against, you know, people doing things related to China. And we're still sitting here like six or seven years later with no answers. And so, um, and seeing that the government has kind of ramped up these efforts with their China initiative and with just increasing escalations related to China. So, um, yeah, um, this is kind of an ongoing issue for us. And we've been bringing, uh, we brought a civil rights lawsuit against the government um, in 2017. And last year, um, the judge basically tossed our case and said that um, there was no basis for us bringing in a case against the government, um, which basically meant that the government was getting away with doing this to us. And to this day, we've had no answers, no explanation, no recourse or anything like that. Um, so yeah, today we're, um, just last week, we appealed the decision, we brought it to the Third Circuit and um, we're continuing to fight this case to try to get answers, not just for ourselves, but for so many other people who are actually living in fear right now, who, um, are afraid that they'll get caught up just like my dad was. Um, and, you know, this is a situation that maybe a lot of people haven't heard about, but, um, you know, within the Chinese American community, especially, you know, for scientists like my dad um, and people like him, there's a lot of fear and, and concern right now that this is only gonna get worse. And so, um, yeah, you know, for for many years we've been fighting and we're gonna keep fighting and um, just wanna say that it's it's always so heartening to have um, the support of people like um, Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity and so many others who have supported us over the years and to be able to, yeah, to express my solidarity for everybody who's going through these kinds of injustices and also to be able to receive the support, it's just, um, it makes things a lot better. So yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for the support. And yeah, um, we're gonna keep pushing forward and you know, there may be opportunities for people to show up like at court dates or to sign petitions or things like that. So I'll definitely keep you posted. Thank you so much, Joyce, for your bravery and your testimony today. And yes, any opportunities for us to support your family, please do share and we'll pass it on to people. Um, so thank you for the beautiful reflections from Russell and Chanton. I don't think they're on the call, but we'll definitely share your warm wishes. Thank you again, Joyce. And we will now hear from a, an offering, a song from Elijah Chum. Elijah is, a co, is the co-director of the New Light Program at the Center for Empowering Refugees and Immigrants. Welcome, Elijah. Hi, can everyone hear me? Um, thank you um, for all the speakers um, that came before me today and for the solidarity that's um, being built in this very moment. Um, and thank you so much, Joyce, for your, your testimony, um, for your friendship, and for standing by my community, the Cambodian community, the Khmer community, um, in the Southeast Asian anti-deportation movement. Um, you've carried so much with you, um, so I'm really humbled and honored to stand by you um, and to do this work together and to continue this, to build this solidarity across uh, the different um, groups that are here today um, to celebrate our differences and to recognize that um, you know the the different systemic violence like racial capitalism and white settler colonialism and neoliberalism has been impacting our community and this country for hundreds of years. So we must recognize that there are you know our elders here in this room from you know ens enslaved and kidnapped African and Black people and um, the indigenous communities that um, also 
their lands were stolen and the Latinx community that is also in some ways um, deported and forever foreigner just as much as the Asian community. Um, and um, for me as being Cambodian, Khmer, being born and raised in white rural Minnesota, um, being a, my parents are genocide survivors. Um, so constantly living and hiding my own identity um, and not hearing their stories because, you know, part of the silence, you know, I don't want to pathologize all of the mental health um, that my parents went through because part of the silence is their survival too and their gift to not share and give all of what they've gone through. It's taken me almost 40 years to hold my parents in this way, to understand my language, to understand mental health skills, to hold them, to transform myself and to get the support I need so that I can hold them. Um, and the beautiful thing that I've seen in this community right now is the intergenerational aspect of us coming together to listen to our elders and to listen to our youth and to listen to everyone in between because we need each other um, across, across the differences. Um, we need to celebrate our differences too. So although we talk about intergenerational trauma and I do not want to dismiss it, um, it is there and it is real and I feel it every day. There's also intergenerational protective factors and that is a strength-based model. And that is something we do not talk about. And so when we look deeply into our history, um, we can look for those strength-based mo models of solidarity across the communities. There was solidarity early on in the labor um, fights with W.E. Du Bois and Martin Luther King and civil rights. And you know we do actually share a lot in common with poor white people. You know, um, it's the, this is a class issue too. Um, so we, um, and I, I'm sorry, I know I'm supposed to sing, but I just wanted to say all these things that is in my heart and I'm just um, very moved by today and everyone's voices. Um, I know we're on Zoom, but I feel like, uh, you know, the seismic waves um, from our heart strings. Um, so, so I will just sing the song. Um, again, I'm a, uh, I was born into a Christian family. My dad is a pastor of a church of the Nazarene in Rochester. And to me, uh, learning how to sing and singing in the choir and really being left alone because I just played by myself a lot in nature and singing to nature and singing these hymnals um, gave me a lot of joy and in some ways still do. This is not necessarily a hymnal, but it reminds me of one that I grew up with. Um, it's called Tim Schull. And now I'm nervous. <clears throat> and allow me just to have a sip of water as well. Cold is the water. It freezes your already cold mind, already cold, cold mind. And death is at your doorstep, and it will steal your innocence, but it will not steal your substance. But you are not alone in this. And you are not alone in this. As brothers, we will stand and will hold your hand. Hold your hand. And you are the mother. The mother of your baby child, the one to whom you gave life. And you have your choices. And these are what make woman great, her ladder to the sun. 
but you are not alone in this. And you are not alone in this. As sisters, we will stand and will hold your hand. Hold your hand. And I will tell the night. Whisper, lose your sight. And I can move the mountains for you. Thank you. Thank you, Elijah, for that powerful song and your amazing work in the community. I've been deeply blessed to be in partnership with you and all the work that you are doing for us. We will now be moving into the call to action. Now that our spirits are nourished and we're deeply feeling hopefully connected to the solidarity we so, we so need. I want to bring in um, Joyce Nakamura, who is also on the planning committee and a part of the San Francisco Bay Area Day of Remembrance, who's gonna also share with the call to action. Good morning, please join us at the 43rd Annual Day of Remembrance. This year's theme, no one is free until we are all free, 80 years after EO 9066, honors Japanese American and African American solidarity and recognizes that the fight for racial justice for Black people in the U.S. uplifts us all. John Osaki, director producer of the film, Reparations, will be the keynote speaker. Karen Kai and Bob Rusty will be honored with the Clifford Ueda Humanitarian Award for their lifelong service to the Japanese American community. The signature candle lighting ceremony includes survivors from World War II incarceration and individuals that reflect the program's theme. Performances will feature musician Anthony Brown and spoken word artists Lauren Ito and Jerry Waki. Lauren will, will pay special tribute to poet and social justice activist Janice Mirakatani. Please join us by registering at the link on the slide. And just to draw your attention, we're in the chat, we're putting a link to all the calls to action that you'll be able to see. On February 4th, the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America, the, the National African American Reparations Commission, Human Rights Watch, the Associate, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, along with 365 organizations and over 40 individuals, submitted a letter to the House leadership to urge them to bring HR 40, the Commission to Study and Develop Reparation Proposals for African Americans Act to a full House vote. With a record 215 members committed, committed to voting yes, H.R. 40 should pass the House so long as leadership sticks to promises to advance the bill. Please share this letter widely and join the social media campaign during Black History Month to urge that H.R. 40 be put to a floor vote. Links to the letter and the Black History Month social media campaign toolkit can be found on the slide. Kidnapped by the U.S. government during World War II, Japanese Latin Americans, or JLAs, were incarcerated in detention camps for hostage exchange with Japan. As quote-unquote illegal aliens, JLAs were ineligible for reparations under the Civil Liberties Act of 1988. After pursuing years of legal and legislative actions, the Campaign for Justice, or CFJ, 
took their fight to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. This commission ruled that the US government owes material and moral redress to the JLAs for violations of human rights. Support JLA reparations and join the JLA Day of Action on February 24th to bring pressure to the Biden administration to comply with the commission's ruling. Go to the CFJ website link on the slide for details on how you can participate on the day of action and to sign the JLA Regis petition. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. And I wanna bring back Tara who will announce this event. Hi everyone. Um, so I just wanted to share um, the Berkeley and K Student Union or NSU um, Day of Remembrance event, which will be this Friday, February 18th um, at 6.20 p.m. Um, they are having it uh, in, uh, in person. Uh, so if you would like to join via Zoom, I believe they'll also have that option. So I'll put Berkeley NSU's Zoom on the chat. And this is a collaborative Day of Remembrance event. They work with Muslim Student Association and as well as a Latin American um, student organization as well. So if you can join us. Thank you again so much, everyone. Thank you, Tara. So during African American History Month, we also are inviting faith communities to deepen your understanding and engagement in reparations. One of our um, interns, Amy Best um, from PSR, created a toolkit, a faith and reparations toolkit, which we're inviting you to use to dialogue and deepen um, your understanding and engagement with your own community. So the link for that toolkit is also in the call to action handout. And just two more calls to action. We want, we want you all to, to leave with, with many next steps. One way to stop Asian hate is, man, is the ways in which it's manifested in our ICE detention and deportation machine. So we are um, working with a coalition to pass a statewide bill called the Vision Act. And this bill would prevent ICE from arresting people once they are paroled from jail and prison. So we invite you to learn about this bill and to join our faith-rooted efforts to pass this bill. Um, and you can email me if you're interested in getting more information about that. And last, on a very local level, to address the harm our Black, Brown, and API communities have been experiencing in Oakland, Interfaith Movement is partnering with Faith Alliance for a Moral Economy, a, a project of e-based, um, to be engaging the faith community to call for a moral budget that strengthens our public safety. So some of you participated in the letter, faith letter that we delivered to Mayor Schaaf last year, and we're inviting you to continue to partner with us as we move into the mid-year budget cycle. So again, the sign up will also be um, in the handout. And with that, I want to introduce our uh, Minister Sherry Murphy, who will be leading the closing prayer. Minister Sherry is a national and global spokesperson for economic and racial justice, and is currently the faith organizer with Faith Alliance for a Moral Economy, an initiative of the East Bay Alliance for a Sustainable Economy. So welcome, Minister Sherry. Thank you, Kayla. I'm just honored to be here. And so now for our closing prayer, I invite you to find your breath. Just allow yourself to find your breath. Being fully present to this moment. Allowing yourself just to anchor in the precious space and time of right now. And as we focus on our breath, let us allow it to be a symbol which speaks to the essence of one life, the source of solidarity, remembrance, and honoring. The source of all life, just breathe 
on us. The one who abides and loves each and every one despite the color of one's skin, historical oppressions of the past and present. I call this divine source my comforter in this moment of disruption of the status quo, the divine shifter. And like the great ancestor, it is the North Star which provides light guiding me to the promised land, a renewed purpose and miraculous healing. It is my Sophia, my divine intelligence as it beckons me to practice faith, to remember because remembering is revolutionary. It connects us to the legacy of those who went before us, that in every moment, every moment, I get to choose who I am in the world. It claims that love will have the final word, that regardless of appearances, love never fails. And since everything born both seen and beyond the veil is a part of this creator of all. There is nothing that will separate me from the love that goes by many names. There is nothing that separates us as we call for justice, for righteousness, for liberation, nothing. Not death, condemnation, racism, US imperialism, xenophobia or a virtual world, there is an interconnection with each and every one of us. And so it's from this deep place of knowing that I speak on behalf of this gathering, that it has been, and it is a continuous blessing, for this is not the end. I am declaring that this is the start of a revolution to learn new things, and act on new insights. That on this day, we have been reminded of our greatest antidote for faith, healing, and resilience. It's joy. And through song, prayer, dance, words spoken collectively, it has reminded us of our inherent worth as releases anything which says otherwise. So I've heard my elders say, healing has begun where the wound was made, declaring that this moment was an invitation for new life, regardless of what the circumstances we have found ourselves in. Because there is nothing bigger than the thirst for love, righteousness, and liberation. And that to remember that we are not alone during this time of great transition that there has been a renewed commitment to walk together through this healing of hope and resilience. For we shall now declare that despair shall not tempt us in forgetting the path to peace. Oh, I'm so grateful. I'm giving thanks that this collective power of one body and one mind, that joy has made itself visible. That this faith is not a wishful thought, but the confident, expectant, joyful knowledge that the world we live in is being changed today. I give thanks that this gathering has reminded us to be truth tellers, to hold, to hold on to the truth, to hold on to love and not deserve it. I give thanks that for this service as an opportunity to allow each breath to be in reflection to be in praise and to be in solidarity. I give thanks, I give thanks, I give thanks. And so knowing that my words shall not come back void, I release this prayer by saying, Ashe, Amen, and so it is. Amen. Pastor Sherry, thank you so much for that powerful prayer. And as we transition from this sacred space of feeling our spirit and our hearts are full, we have a closing dance offering. 
that is brought to us by Ito Yosakoi, a participatory dance that they have created for us. They are a dance group based in San Francisco, Japantown, and this is an energetic dance. So you're invited to, to take the spirits of, that, that are inside of you and to move with this very upbeat video. Um, and I'm gonna play, play it and you can hear the invitation. Hello everyone, we are Ito Yosukoi, a Yosukoi dance team based in San Francisco, Japantown. We're very grateful to be performing at today's Interfaith Day of Remembrance Vigil. The piece that we'll be performing today is called Yotre. It is a soodori or audience participation dance that originates from the Yosukoi Soran style of Hokkaido. It is performed by many teams, both in Japan and around the world. Like many soodori, it encourages the audience to dance along and embrace the spirit of Yosukoi. We thought that this sense of togetherness was fitting for today's event, which is bringing many different communities together for a common cause. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Come on!
ありがとうございましたありがとうございました Thank you, everyone, for being a part of this beautiful vigil. And a big thank you to all the speakers, the planning team, the co sponsors,、um, and all of the participants. And thank you, Gayla. Thank you, Gayla. <laughs> Thanks, Gayla. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thank you, everybody. Yes. Thanks, What a blessing. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Blessings to you. Blessings to you all. Thank you. Enjoy this beautiful day, everyone. Yes, you too. Thank you for your son. Oh, thank you. Thanks, everyone, for their organizing and testimony today. And thank you, Elder Chisu. Yes. Ciao. Thank you, Allison. You know, this is like usually we'd be hanging out if we were in person and getting to chit chat. <laughs> so I'm just looking at your faces. <laughs> the tech held up, I think. Did it seem smooth on the other end? Yes.、Yeah, job. Okay, good. Great job. Oh, great.、Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Yeah, Gayla, I'm glad we used your、wow. Wi Fi and not mine. <laughs> yeah. Well, mine, because I crashed. <laughs> oh, I saw you go and come back.、Uh -huh. Yeah. I'm like, how does it crash open? Oh my goodness. It's amazing. It's beautiful.、Yeah. Nicely done. It was、everyone. so powerful. Thank you. Yes. Did you want us to stay or shall we? Can we? No, we can sign off. I mean, I, I did want to do a debrief. I was going to send out an email to see if folks could just gather next week, like maybe around the same time on Wednesday. Yeah. Just to capture feedback. If that works for people, I'll send out a calendar invite.、Um, yeah. So that's, I was going to invite folks to that. But for now, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Gayla,、hey, wonderful you. job. Thank you, thank yeah. You. Wonderful job.、So、Great job, Gayla. Thank you and everybody. Yeah, beautiful. Sarah, thank you. Yes. That video together.